Hello everybody, welcome to the Ozone and welcome to the Puppet Carver audiobook. Now, if you are watching this before, what is it, like the 6th of July this comes out, I think, something like that. If you're watching this before July, basically, then this is just a preview of the book um, that I'm reading, so I'm reading it early, basically, um, but the full audiobook will be out, at, like, after it actually comes out. Um, but this is just a preview if you're watching before July. Um, if not, then welcome to the full audiobook for this story. Um, this is called The Puppet Carver, and I'm really, really excited for this one because the front cover looks very, very cool. The other stories are called Jump for Tickets and Pizza Kit, and I cannot wait for them either. They, they sound like they're going to be good stories, so let's, let's hope they live up to that name. <laughs> anyway, let's start reading, I think. Um, so this is... The Puppet Carver. On stage, the banjo strumming animatronic pig slowed in its movements, emitted a sputtering sound, and then ground to a halt. Really? Another one? Jack yelled. The stupid pig was the third animatronic to break in less than a month, and fixing those things cost money. Money that Jack didn't have. A pig animatronic, huh? <laughs> Are we talking about pig patch here? Are we talking about pig patch? Um... This place was bleeding him dry. When he bought it three years ago, he had thought that the pizza playground, a kiddie pizzeria complete with games and animatronics, would be a great investment. Pizza, games, talking and singing animal characters. Those were all things kids loved, right? And parents were always looking for ways to keep their little brats entertained, especially on their birthdays. He had anticipated a lot of birthday business, but the fact was the kids weren't showing up. And Jack didn't know why. Was it because parents these days packed their kids' schedules so full of sports and lessons that there was no time left for mindless entertainment? Or did kids today just prefer mindless entertainment of a, sort, of a different sort on their computers or video game consoles? Whatever the reason, Jack was losing money like it was water pouring through a sieve. Just this morning, he had to order the kitchen staff to throw away expired ingredients for the pizzas nobody was going to eat, and now he had to figure out how to pay for repairs of the animatronics that nobody was going to see. Porter! Sage! Get out here! Jack yelled. He was so angry and stressed, he felt his face heating up. He remembered the doctor telling him to be mindful of his blood pressure, but how could you keep your blood pressure down when everything around you is flying out of control? Porter came out from behind the stage, and Sage emerged from the custodial closet. Both were in their early twenties, young enough to be Jack's sons. But these boys were no sons of his. What a couple of losers, Jack thought as they shambled up to him like dogs, making a futile attempt to please their master. Um... Well, Jack wasn't pleased with either one of them. Porter, the short one with glasses, was a handyman who was supposed to be in charge of the animatronics. He claimed to be some kind of inventor, and when he was not ineptly trying to follow Jack's orders, he was always tinkering with the tools and equipment in the storage room. Sage, the tall one who wore his long black hair and braids, was supposed to keep the place clean. He fancied himself a writer. He spent his break sitting at a table in the dining area, hunched over a notebook, scribbling away on his so-called novel. So is this a story about Pizzeria Simulator? Because at the moment it seems like it is with um, with like designing an, uh, a pizzeria, I guess, and with the fact that Pig Patch is here, I guess, Mediamoka Melodies. Very interesting. Clearly neither of these idiots are going anywhere, Jack thought. They were lucky he saw fit to pay them minimum wage and let them take home leftover pizza. The pig's busted, Jack said. Take it back to storage. Wow, those things are dropping like flies, Sage said, looking up at almost empty stage. I don't need your commentary, Captain Obvious, Jack said. I just need your muscles to take the porker to the storage room. Yes, sir, Sage said, but he looked like he was suppressing the urge to roll his eyes. Jack couldn't stand insubordination. Well, soon your, all your animatronic problems will be solved anyway, Porter said, stepping up onto the sa stage to help move the broken figure. I'm almost finished with the prototype of my machine. 
It will create low cost but highly functional animatronics made from only an, expen an inexpensive slab of wood. You're gonna be amazed, Jack. I'll believe it when I see it, Jack muttered. Something about the little guy's ungrounded optimism was especially irritating. Porter grinned like he was being issued a particularly satisfying challenge. Oh, you'll see it and you'll believe it. He turned to Sage. You ready to lift this thing? Let's do it on the count of three. One, two. Huh. <laughs> this, this is interesting so far. I want to see where this goes. With Sage's help, Porter set down the deceased pig animatronic in a corner of the storage room. I get so tired of the way that ogre talks to us, Porter said. Once I get, my, once I get a patent on my invention and find a buyer, I'm going to be out of here so fast I'll leave a dust trail. And I'll be stuck here eating your dust, Sage said with a sigh. Maybe someday you'll take pity on me and invite me to your mansion and feed me a meal. You know, remember your old co-worker who's still living on leathery reheated pizza slices? <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, Porter gave Sage a pat on the shoulder. Hey, you won't need my pity. You'll get your novel published. Your book will be on the bestseller list. You'll tour the country doing signings. No more reheated pizza for you. Sage grinned shyly. You really think it's good enough to be published? Of course I do, Porter said. He was happy to give his buddy a pep talk, but it was an honest pep talk. Sage really was talented. It's way better than a lot of published books I've read, and it's not just me who thinks so. Your creative writing teacher says so too, right? Porter and Sage attended the local community college together, though they majored in radically different fields, medical engineering for Porter and English for Sage. Sage nodded. She's been very complimentary of it. Yeah. Well, there you go. And actually, I've got to say, I find your work not just entertaining, but inspiring. My invention is partially inspired by your novel. Sage raised an eyebrow. How's that? Well, the puppet carver is about a wooden man who wants to be real, right? Sage nodded. Well, my puppet carver takes an ordinary piece of wood and transforms it into something that seems alive. He hadn't heard Jack yelling, so he figured the grumpy boss must be temporarily distracted. Porter pulled back the glittery purple curtain that hid his invention along with several broken animatronics. Come check it out. If Jack comes back here, I'll pretend to be working on the animatronics and you can pretend to be cleaning something. This is really interesting. So the, so the puppet, the name, the puppet carver for this book is actually a name of a book in the book. <laughs> it's, it's bookception, but also it's about a wooden man who wants to be real. So it's a bit like Pinocchio, right? Am I, am I getting that right? It's a bit like Pinocchio. Huh. Interesting. Um, this also like explains a lot about FNAF AR animatronics and their skins. Like how how is there an animatronic made of wood in FNAF AR? Well, th this is just the technology these days. Um, Sage smiled. You're a bad influence, Porter. He followed the shorter man behind the old curtain that had probably hung in front of the stage once. Here it is, Porter said, gesturing with a flourish to a clunky looking piece of equipment. The puppet carver. It looks kind of like a giant wood chipper. Oh. Oh, wood chipper. Isn't that, that's something from, um, sorry to keep interrupting, by the way. But that looks, that's something from um, FNAF World, right? Sage said. Well, that's the basic concept, Porter said in a salesman voice. But it does so much more. Like a wood chipper, the puppet carver had an opening where the wood was fed in. But what, 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 eh. But what happened once the wood was inside the machine was far more sophisticated. Once he got a few of the kinks worked out, Porter planned to apply for a patent. He hoped that the puppet carver would be first of many patented inventions. Here, help me load this log into it and I'll show you what happens. Okay, Sage said, but he sounded a little unsure. This is a safe piece of equipment, right? The safest, Porter said. All the sharp parts are on the inside. The machine was a tall vertical metal cylinder with a sliding door that was opened by pushing a button. When Porter pushed the button, the door slid open, revealing a human-sized compartment that was surrounded by metal blades. Together, Sage and Porter hefted a five-foot uh, five log and stood it on its end inside the compartment. Sorry, I, I always forget how to say that word. 
I, I know, ah, cedar? No, it can't be. I, I don't know why, I just can't find my way to pronounce it. And I'm always like, oh, when you guys tell me. Porter pushed a button, and now we wait. The machine hummed to life, then grew louder and louder. It whirred, then sputtered, then roared. Is it supposed to be making all these sounds? Sage yelled over the noise. The mechanical noises were like music to Porter. He smiled. It's working perfectly. After less than a minute of noisy shaking, the machine grew quiet. Behold! Porter pointed to the inner compartment. Here's the best part. I'm beholding, Sage said, sounding like he wasn't sure what to think yet. Oh, what he's going to do is he's going to put a log in the machine and then out the other side comes a puppet. Um, I assume, like an animated puppet. Um, Porter pushed the button and the door slid open, revealing a fully jointed, wooden, human-like feet figure. Now I just have to give a gentle tug. Porter grabbed the wooden figure by its shoulders and pulled, then pulled harder. Sage laughed. It looks like you're helping the machine give birth. That's exactly what I'm doing, Porter said. He gave a mighty pull, and the figure inside the machine finally turned loose. Porter pulled it the rest of the way out and then set it up on its feet. Porter knew that some people would describe the figure as crude, but to him it was beautiful. It was in the shape of a small man. The simple wooden figure reminded him of the drawing models they had used in his high school art class. Even though it was basic, it could still be extremely useful to someone like Grumpy Boss. Put the figure in a fuzzy suit to resemble a bunny or a fox or a bear, and you'd have a low-cost animatronic that would be perfect for the pizzeria. Huh, okay. <laughs> okay, okay, Sage said, smiling. I have to admit, that's pretty cool. Oh, you haven't even seen the cool part yet, Porter said. Just wait. He pushed a button on the wooden figure's lower back, and it slowly started to move. It turned its head to its left, then to the right. It lifted its arms so it looked like it was reaching out for a hug. <laughs> Told you so. Uh, whoa, Sage said, sounding amazed. You made this all by yourself? Porter laughed. Yep, all by myself, like a big boy. It's incredibly cost efficient. If you can afford a log, you can make an animatronic. You know, I think Jack might actually be impressed by this, Sage said, walking in a circle around the animatronic and watching its movements. I hope so, Porter said, knowing that the boss wasn't easy to impress. It would be nice to get some respect around here, and maybe a little money too. No doubt, Sage said. But if you keep it up with the inventions, you won't be hanging around this dump for long anyway. You're on your way, man. So are you, Porter said. Sage had let him read the first few chapters of his novel, and Porter had been blown away by his friend's vivid language and imagination. I hope so, Sage said. I sure don't want to spend my best years in this place. Oh, Porter said, looking back at the puppet carver. I almost forgot an important step in the demonstration. He squatted down beside the machine. After the puppet comes out, you want to slide out the drawer at the bottom here. It's full of all sawdust and splinters left over from the carving process. If you don't empty it out, the machine won't work right the next time you use it. He dumped the, con the, he dumped the contents of the compartment into the trash can. Kind of like the lint filter on the dryer, Sage said. Exactly. Are there any people working in this place? Jack's booming voice yelled from the darkening area. I've got tables that need wiping down and a stage that needs setting up. Sage chucked Porter on the shoulder. I guess we're not quite ready for fame and fortune yet, huh? Porter laughed. Nope, not when there are tables to be wiped and animatronics to be arranged. They headed for the dining area, prepared for a ba barrage of <laughs> verbal abuse from Jack. It was a good thing they were prepared. So does anybody besides me work here? Jack yelled. His face was purple with rage. Oh, Michael! <laughs> or William. Um, if Porter liked Jack more, he'd worry about his health. The guy's blood pressure must be through the roof. Sorry, sir. We were taking care of some stuff in the back. Well, people don't see the back. They see the front. And the front is a mess. The tables are dirty. You need to fix things up on the stage so it doesn't look like there are animatronics missing. That was exactly what we were working on, sir. The animatronics, Porter said. Soon all your problems with animatronics will be solved for a fraction of what you've been spending. Porter internally cringed to hear himself sounding like a TV infomercial. But his past experiences with Jack had taught him that the man liked cheesy marketing speech. He thought it sounded smart. 
I won't hold my breath. Jack harumphed. <laughs> well, you don't. You won't have to. How about I let you see it on Friday morning before we open? Porter said. I think I should have all the bugs worked out by then. You'd better, Jack said, which Porter decided to take for Jack's version of a yes. So, what are you standing around for? Get to work. Yes, sir. Sage grabbed a bucket of bleach water and a rag and started wiping down the tables. So if you're watching the individual video, this is the end of the preview. Um, very good so far. If you are watching the full audiobook uh, later on after July, then enjoy the rest of the video. Okay, welcome to part two. So I now have the full book. Um, so we can now continue. Unfortunately, I don't actually know how to change the layout of the pages here. So we're just going to be reading like this. Uh, I'm very sorry about that. But anyway, let's continue. So, Porter climbed up on the stage and started fiddling with the animatronics. Jack got up from his table. I've got to take care of some things in the office, but I'll be back to check up on you. Yes, sir, Porter said, dragging an animatronic centre stage. Once Jack was safely out of earshot, Porter muttered, Somebody must have spit in his oatmeal this morning. This morning and every morning, Sage said. Have you ever seen the man in a good mood? Porter rolled his eyes. Not once. I wonder if he ever is. Maybe when he's not at work? Do you think there's anything he does for fun? Sure, Sage said, looking up from the table he was wiping. He kicks puppies, robs grandmothers, makes orphans cry. Porter laughed. We'd better be quiet or we'll get in trouble. Sage grinned. When aren't we in trouble? They worked quietly for a while. Once Porter had things working on the stage, he felt a strange presence in the room. The hair on the back of his neck prickled. He felt like he was being watched. He turned around and saw he had been right. A little girl around four years old was standing right at the edge of the stage. She looked up at Porter with big brown eyes. Hi, she said. Hi, Porter said. A few feet behind her were a man and a woman, presumably the little girl's parents. Hi folks, he added awkwardly. Customers had become such a rarity that it was always such a surprise when they showed up. The little girl pointed at the animatronic bear. Is that Baron Von Baer? <laughs> yep, that's the Baron, Porter said. Really, he shouldn't have had the curtains closed so that any kids who might show up wouldn't have seen the, anim the characters in their dormant state. Is he going to sing? The little girl said. Yes, Porter said. The first show's in 15 minutes. Is there pizza? Of course there's pizza. Porter swiped a few menus from the host station and handed them to the family. Why don't you folks sit at any table you want and I'll go find you a server. Uh, I don't know how to say this name, so I'm very sorry, but Angie, or Angie, no, Angie. Angie, the only server left in the place, was sitting in the kitchen doing her homework. She was studying to be a licensed practical nurse, she had told Porter, because this restaurant gig was obviously a dead end. Edwin, the cook, was playing on his phone. Hey, Ange, Porter said. You've got a table full of customers. Angie looked up from her textbook. Really? You mean I might actually earn a tip tonight? Porter grinned. It's looking like it. Don't spend it all in one place. Hey, and I might actually get to cook something, Edwin said, pocketing his phone. We need to use some of these ingredients. Half of them are about to go bad anyway. Angie was on her feet. I won't share that information with one table of customers. Edwin laughed. Good idea. A few more families trickled in over the course of the evening, but business was still slow, and Porter spent most of the night trying to look busy so Jack wouldn't yell at him too much. The mood in the place was all wrong. A children's pizza, Emporium, was supposed to be loud and lively and full of laughter, but the only thing you were likely to hear in this place were Jack's outbursts. It was always such a relief to walk out in the fresh night air after closing time, Porter, Sage, Angie and Edwin left Jack and his anger inside and instantly the mood was lighter. Sage, you guys want to get something to eat? Porter asked. He probably should have, he probably should save what little money he had, but he couldn't face the thought of bolting down another pot of instant, oh my god, okay, everyone's going to go crazy at me for this. It's pronounced ramen, right? I don't eat ramen. I don't know what ramen is. Raymen. Ray <laughs> Raymen. <laughs> Another pot of instant noodles in his apartment. <laughs> there were murmurings of agreement. 
What do you want? Porter asked. Not pizza? Everybody yelled in chorus. It was a running joke. They ate so many leftover slices that they were sick of them, but they kept on eating them because they were free. Actually, paying to eat pizza, even good pizza, had become unimaginable. They ended up at the Golden Heifer, <laughs> even though none of them had enough money for burgers and had to settle for grilled cheese or BLTs instead. They shared an order of fries between the four of them, which the tired-looking waitress placed in the middle of the table. Hey, you guys aren't looking for a cook, are you? Edwin asked the waitress as she set down the ketchup bottle. Not right now, hon, she said, but if you want to fill out an application, we'll put it on file. Thanks, I'll do that. Edwin flashed her a charming smile. After the waitress left, Edwin's f smile faded. I tell you what, guys, I'm pounding the pavement to find another job. If you all want to keep on eating, you should start looking too. You think Jack's going to fire us? Angie asked, pouring out a puddle of ketchup on the fry plate. Well, that's a possibility too, Edwin said, sipping his coffee. But I think the place is going to close down before Jack has a chance to fire us. I've worked in the restaurant business a lot longer than you kids have. I can tell when a place isn't long for this world. It gets the stink of death on it. Are you sure that's not just the stink of pepperoni past its expiration date? Sage asked. Same difference, Edwin asked. Uh, said, <laughs> grabbing a french fry and dragging it through the shared puddle of ketchup. If we were selling that pepperoni, it wouldn't be going bad and we wouldn't be in danger of being out of a job. Wow, now I'm depressed, Angie said, stirring her sopro uh, soproda? What am I going on about? Stirring her soda with a straw. No need to get suppressed, Edwin said. You're in nursing school. You've got a good career ahead of you and Porter and Sage are college boys. I'm the only one at this table who's looking down a dead end street. Well, maybe you're not, Porter said. I've just about finished my invention, which will bring the cost of animatronics way, way down. I'm showing it to Jack on Friday. If he doesn't have to keep replacing expensive animatronics, then he can pour his money into advertising and better food quality. Maybe even buy a few new games. Then customers will start coming in again. Well, I admire your optimism, Angie said, popping a French fry into her mouth. I hope it pays off. I think it actually might, Sage said. Porter showed it to me tonight. He's calling it the puppet carver because of my novel. It's pretty amazing, he grinned. The invention, I mean, not my novel. Though the novel's pretty amazing too. Your confidence is inspiring, Edwin said. He raised a, his soda glass. Let's toast to a brighter future. To a brighter future, the friend said, clinking glasses. Porter and Sage shared a two-bedroom basement apartment. From the window, they could see the spectacular view of people's feet walking on the sidewalk above. The apartment was dark and damp, with cheap panelling on the walls and ancient moss-coloured carpet on the squeaky floor. The one thing you could say for it was that the rent was fairly cheap, especially with the two of them sharing it. Tonight was the same as every other night. They got home. Sage went to his room to work on his novel. Porter went to his room to work on designs for his inventions. Porter drew and measured and made notes, working until he was so tired he could no longer hold his eyes open. Then he would collapse into bed, setting the alarm so he would wake up in time to get ready for the morning classes he took before returning to abusive pizza land, as he called it, in the afternoon. It was a gruelling schedule that wore him to the bone, but he kept on pushing, sure that he was going to find that he was on his way to do something better. Meanwhile, Sage returned to his manuscript, typing in the dim glow of his desk lamp until late in the night. From The Puppet Carver, a novel by Sage Brantley. What do you mean from? the? Okay. <laughs> uh, Sylvester Pine emerged from the chamber as a perfect specimen. The first thing he saw were his hands, which were fully jointed. He watched himself curl them into fists then straightened them back out and spread the fingers apart. Remarkable, yes, his creator said. Sylvester nodded. Would you like to see more of yourself? His creator asked. Sylvester nodded again. His creator smiled. You are programmed with the power of language, both the ability to comprehend and the ability to speak. When I ask you a question, please answer it with a yes or no. Now, would you like to see more of yourself? Yes, Silver Sylvester said. The words slipped from his lips effortlessly. Good, 
his creator said. Follow me. Sylvester let his creator lead him to a large piece of glass he somehow knew was called a mirror. Sylvester regarded himself. He was a complete person with a symmetrical facial feature with symmetrical facial features and eyes that opened and closed. When he wished to move an arm or a leg, it moved according to his unspoken commands. He was not yet clothed, but when he was, he knew that he would strongly resemble a man with one exception. The surface of his face and body, unlike his creator's, was not soft and pliable, because instead of flesh, he was made of smooth, solid wood. You're a handsome fellow, his creator said, and a highly functioning one. You can think, you can move, you can talk. You have three of the five senses regular humans have, sight, hearing, and smell. What senses am I missing? His creator shrugged. Nothing's very important. You don't... Oh, sorry, nothing very important. You don't have a sense of taste because you have no need to eat. And you don't have a sense of touch because we haven't been able to perfect the technology yet. But this isn't a wholly bad thing. You'll have no ability to feel heat or cold or ability to feel pain. In some ways, this lack makes you superior to those who have it. Sylvester touched his left hand with his right hand. Then he reached out and touched his creator on the shoulder. His creator was right. Right? His creator was right. Sylvester felt nothing. I do, I do want to say, uh, this part here, for some reason it reminds me of the Afton dialogue at the beginning of Sister Location. You know, when he goes, she can dance, she can sing, she has a equipped with helium balloons. <laughs> you know, it, it's the part where he goes, you can think, you can move, you can talk. You have three of the five senses. You know, it, it has the same structure for some reason, I, I think. I don't know. That's that's a tiny connection, obviously, but um, it just reminded me of that. Before Jack entered the house, he took off his shoes. Becky forbade... Oh, sorry. I, for some reason, I thought it was a name, even though it doesn't have a capital letter. Becky forbade wearing, his, wearing shoes inside because they might scuff the beautiful new hardwood floors. Jack understood this. He knew how much the new flooring had cost. He had paid for it, but taking off his shoes and holding them in his hands still made him feel strangely sneaky, as though he were a thief trying to break into his own house. He walked into the newly remodelled home. The hardwood floors gleamed. The new living room furniture was sleek and modern, if not as comfortable as he would like. Becky loved to watch all those shows about redoing houses and she had really put her heart and soul into making their comfy older house look elegant and new. But when Jack looked at his plush surroundings, all he could see was money flying out of his pockets. He found Becky at the kitchen table reading a home and garden magazine and sipping a diet soda. Even though it was late, she was still dressed in a designer blouse and dress slacks, her hair and makeup perfectly in order. Ever since she got the house looking the way she wanted it, it was like she had to look a certain way too. No more lounging around in sweatpants. She had to match the decor. She looked up from her magazine. You know, I've been thinking we might want to knock down on a wall before the, between the living room and dining room, she said. Have more of an open concept. An open wallet's more like it, Jack said. My wallet. He stomped over to the refrigerator. New stainless steel and very expensive and looked inside. What was the good of having a top-of-the-line refrigerator if there wasn't anything worth eating inside it? We never have anything good to eat in this house, Jack said. Becky rolled her eyes. I had a fruit smoothie for dinner. I'd be happy to make you one too. That's not food, Jake. Uh, Jake? Jack growled. Food is something you can chew. Becky got up from the table and started selecting fruit from the fruit bowl. Hunt. I know you'd love to eat a big juicy snake steak every night, not snake, uh, but the doctor says it's bad for your cholesterol and blood pressure. A fruit smoothie with protein powder is much healthier, and besides, it wouldn't hurt you to go down a pound size. Jack's head was pounding with both hunger and anger. Nothing is ever good enough for you, is it? Everything always has to be improved. The house, your wardrobe, my waistline, everything always has to be upgraded again and again. Becky was dropping blueberries into the blender. Well, in the case of your waistline, it would be more of a downgrade that's needed. She smiled at him. It was the same smile she, he used to find radiant. 
But paired with tonight's criticism, it was just annoying. That's not funny, Jack said. Stop making that smoothie. I don't want that smoothie. I'm going out for a hamburger. But your cholesterol... If I die from cholesterol, at least I'll die full and happy, Jack said. He stormed out of the house, then realised he'd forgotten his shoes and had to tiptoe back in to get them. It wasn't the dramatic exit he'd been hoping for. Jack pulled up to the drive through at the Golden Heifer. Thank you for choosing Golden Heifer, if I'm saying that correctly. Order when you're ready, the voice on the speaker said. Give me the moo and oink, double bacon cheeseburger, a large fry and a peanut butter shake. I keep wanting to say snake, Jack said. That'll be 9.25. Please pull up to the window, the voice said. Jack shoved a 10 at the young cashier in the window and grabbed his order. He pulled into an empty parking space to eat his meal. When he unwrapped his burger, there was no bacon on it. Enraged, he got out of the car and stomped up to the drive through window, holding the, bake, uh, the burger in his hand as evidence. Yeah, that's, that's very relatable. The cashier, a petite young woman with mousy brown hair, said, I'm sorry, sir, but the drive through is for cars only. If you need to speak to someone, you need to go inside to the restaurant. I ordered the moo and oink double bacon cheeseburger and you left out the oink. Jack yelled, I'm not going inside the restaurant. I'm standing here until you make my order right. I demand bacon. <laughs> what a Karen. Uh, the cashier, who was probably still in high school, looked nervous. Our company policy is no customers on foot at the drive-thru. I don't give a plugged nickel for what your company's policy is. I'm standing here until I get paid good money for. Un uh, until I get what I paid good money for, sorry. So, the cashier said with a quiver in her voice, there was no bacon on your burger? That's what I said, Jack thundered. Do you not speak English, or are you just an idiot? I'm so sorry that you're frustrated, sir, the cashier said. I'm going to fix the problem for you, but you have to understand, I'm new at this job, today's my first day. And if you worked for me, it'd be your last, Jake said. The young woman looked like she was near tears, which Jack found strangely satisfying. Oh my god. He's an awful human being. Once his order was finally corrected, Jack stomped back to his car and gobbled down the food like a starving dog. A smoothie was not to dinner. He was a man, and men needed to eat. He knew he was consuming thousands of calories, but once the food was all gone, he still felt empty. He reached into the glove compartment and pulled out the bank statement that had come earlier in that day. Jack had a master's degree in business and was an expert number cruncher. But no matter how he crunched them, these numbers were bad. It shouldn't be this way. Many years ago, when he was in college, Jack had envisioned himself on Wall Street as a real mover and shaker in the world of finance. When that hadn't panned out, he had gotten a new job at a bank and started to move his way up the ranks. He worked there several years and his career had been on the rise, until he had butted heads with his superiors and yelled at his subordinates one too many times and gotten himself fired. Exactly, so the way to be good in life is to uh, be nice to others. That's, that's just life. <laughs> C'est la vie. You're great with numbers, Jack, his old boss had said. But you're terrible with people. Hard to get along with, they had said. Authoritarian personality, they had said. Jack had figured that if he built his own business, he wouldn't have to be bossed around by, by anybody. When the pizza restaurant building had gone up for sale, he took the plunge. Ah, I see. So it, it, it probably is like Pizzeria Simulator in a lot of ways. He knew that kind of restaurant had been a big hit in other cities, so he figured he couldn't fail. He was wrong. He frowned at the numbers on the bank statement. You didn't have to be an expert number cruncher to see that he owed more than he was earning. In Jack's pocket, his phone, the latest model which Becky had bought him for his birthday and was his money, rang. Hi, Dad. It was Tyson, his son, calling from college. Jack felt his dark mood lift a bit as he thought back to Tyson's childhood, the ball games and the birthday parties. Things had been happier then. Hey, buddy, what's up? Uh, well, I just wanted to let you know that I had to use your credit card for a couple of things today. Tyson's voice sounded tense. One of my classes has an additional textbook I didn't know I needed, and then Tyson paused. That pause made Jack nervous. And then, Jack prompted, I had a little oopsie with the car that ended up costing $900. I'm sorry, Dad. $900 is a big oopsie, a gigantic oopsie. In fact, Jack felt his face heat up with anger. 
I know, Dad. I, I really am sorry. It was an emergency. Sorry doesn't get me $900 back, plus whatever exorbitant sum you had to spend for that useless textbook. His voice was growing louder and louder. Tyson, you're supposed to be off school, learning how to be independent, learning how to be a man. Well, how are you going to be independent and a young man if you just reach for daddy's credit card every time you have a supposed emergency? I, I thought that's why you gave it to me for. Emergencies, Tyson said. His voice had the trembling quality it got when he was upset. Are you talking back to me? Jack roared. No, Dad, I'm just trying to understand. Well, I'm trying to understand too, Jack interrupted him. I'm trying to understand how just two people, the other one being your mother, though you don't need a college education to figure that one out, how just two people can be such an enormous drain on my finances. Jack hung up the phone before he could hear whatever sob stories Tyson was about to tell him. Bleeding him dry. His business, his family were bleeding him dry. Why couldn't they understand that he wasn't an endless source of money? They treated him like a human ATM. With a shaking hand, Jack opened the search engine screen on his phone and typed in the word bankruptcy. From the puppet... Oh, okay, okay. so we got another extract from the puppet cover. I, see. I like this, I like this. By Sage Brantley. What are they? Sylvester asked the little girl. In the cardboard box was a pile of small, squirming, furry creatures. The little girl giggled. They're kittens. Have you ever seen kittens before? Oh! Wait. Hang on a second. Does this relate to the Candy Cadet story? Does it or does it not? I need to know. I feel like it does. I feel like it is a story. Unless it's like a... A, a, a miss memory. I feel like there's a story where there's five kittens, then I don't know what happens exactly, but a, like a man like stitches them together and then puts them in a cardboard box. I swear that is a story. I swear. I need to look that up later. Um, tell me in the comments if I'm right about that. But that sounds like a very good connection there. This is, oh, that's even more evidence that this is all to do with FNAF 6. I think, possibly. I don't know. Possibly. That, that's like a very small connection as well, even if it is true. Um, but I don't know. Uh, that's just something that appeared to me. The little girl giggled. They're kittens. Have you ever seen kittens before? Sylvester shook his head. Really? The little girl said. She picked up one of the creatures. It was orange and white and made a strange mewling sound. They baby cats. I named this one Daffodil. Do you want to pet her? Sylvester reached out and gently stroked the tiny creature. Isn't she soft? The little girl said. Yes, very soft, Sylvester answered. But the truth was, the kitten could have been as hard as a rock for all he knew. He could feel nothing. Oh, oh, oh. Um, Sylvester, like all of his wooden brethren, had been created perfectly to perform the manufacturing jobs that were required of them. But because he and his brethren could not truly feel anything, they were not real. Sylvester couldn't feel the softness of a kitten or the bright sun on his face. He couldn't feel the heat from a fireplace or a cool evening breeze. He couldn't feel the hugs of friendship or the kisses of love. Sylvester could walk and talk like a man, but he wasn't fooling anybody, least of all himself. A wooden man was no man at all. More than anything, Sylvester longed to be real. Oh no. This is going to have a dark ending, I can really feel it. Today was the day. Porter had arrived at work early to set up the puppet carver on the stage. He had even gone to the office supply store and gotten the flip chart so he could explain how the machine worked in an official looking way. He wanted everything to be as professional as possible. If, if, had, sorry, it had to be if he was going to save the restaurant and everybody's jobs. Sage helped him centre the puppet carver on the stage. You've really gone all out, haven't you? Sage said, looking at the flip chart, then at the uncharacteristic jacket and tie Porter was wearing. Yep, Porter said. I'm a nervous rack too. I really need this to go well. I feel like we all need it. Yeah, but no pressure, right? Sage said. Even though our, fa uh, that our futures are all in your hands. Angie came in for a shift and looked up at the stage. Hey, looking snazzy, she said to Porter. Just trying to make a good impression, Porter said. He tugged at the uncomfortable tie. 
He had always thought it strange that hanging a strip of cloth from your neck was supposed to make you seem all businesslike and professional. Who had decided that anyway? Angie flashed at, uh, flashed at him, flashed him a thumbs up. Well, I for one am impressed. Wait till you see the machine work, Porter said. Then you'll be really impressed. Jack stomped into the dining area, his face already set in a scowl. Clearly he was in a terrible mood, but what else was new? Oh, that's right, Jack said, looking up at Porter, who was on stage with his invention. Today's the day you're going to waste my time with that contraption you made. Sir, with all due respect, I don't think you'll find it a waste of time, Sage said. When Porter showed it to me, I thought it was interesting. Yeah, well, you're the one who's always working on that novel, Jack said, using exaggerated finger quotes. Show me a fiction writer, and I'll show you a liar. Ooh. <laughs> Sage opened his mouth, but before he could put his foot in it, Porter jumped in. Why don't we go ahead and get to the demonstration? Sage, can you get Edwin out of the kitchen? He wanted to see this too. Porter hoped having a small errand to run would distract Sage from the fact that Jack had just insulted him. Soon, Edwin, Angie and Sage were sitting at the table near the, the stage, smiling and cheering Porter on. Jack sat at a table in the rear and leaned back with his arms crossed over his chest. Okay, he said. Impress me. Yes, sir, Porter said. He tried to sound confident, even though he was nervous. Sage, can you give me a hand with this log? Sage stepped up and helped him feed the large piece of wood into the machine's opening. I've got it from here. Thanks, buddy, Porter said. And Sage took his place back at the table. Now, I just pushed this button and we watched the magic, Porter said. After he pushed the button, he stepped aside so everybody could have a clear view of the machine. Porter could tell right away that something was wrong. The machine was shaking too much and making a strange sputtering sound. There was an unfamiliar rattle from deep within its core. Porter caught Sage's eye and could tell that Sage knew too. Porter knew that he had currently secured the log inside the compartment, but when he opened the door, the machine spat splinters and sawdust so forcefully that it sprayed from the stage into the dining area. Sage and Edwin and Angie were pelted with the stuff. Angie screamed and shielded her face. Edwin started sneezing. Uh, Sage ran up on the stage. Maybe you should turn it off, ma'am, he said. Porter realised he'd been frozen in horror. He quickly touched the button and the machine sputtered to a stop. He looked at the pile of shavings and sawdust in the compartment and then fearfully he looked at Jack. Jack's face was a mask of rage. His lips were pressed together in a, in a tight line. Porter knew that when those lips parted, whatever came out of them was going to be bad. It was. What came out first was not even the words, but the roar of a lion furious to discover it has been caged. He pounded the table with his fists. Finally, the words came. You absolute idiot. Is this some kind of sick joke? No, sir, Porter said. He was shaking and sweating profusely. Something must have <laughs> malfunctioned this time. It was working great before. You can ask Sage. Sage the liar? Jack asked, his words dripping venom. No matter how terrified he was, Porter wasn't going to let Jack talk about his best friend like that. Sir, Sage isn't... Don't argue with me, Jack yelled. You all seem to have forgotten who's in charge here. He stood up from the table. He looked at Porter, then at Angie, Sage and Edwin in turn. The look on his face was one of sheer disgust. I can't imagine there's a business owner in the world with a sorrier group of employees. Lazy. Incompetent. He looked at the machine and the mess of shavings and sawdust. Destructive. No wonder this business is in the toilet. I'll go down with my ship like a good captain should. But I know who's to blame for it. The crew. I've got half a mind to fire you all here. And now. But we open in 30 minutes. And look at this place. Clean it up, people. He stomped back to his office and slammed the door. Jack Shaw was mixing his metaphors there, Sage said. I'm confused. Are we on a ship or in a toilet? Angie shook her head. I don't know how you can joke at a time like this. We were going to get fired. Oh, I don't think he'll fire us, Edwin said. He won't want to hire and train new people, not with the business going under. We'll just lose our jobs when the restaurant closes. Is that supposed to be good news? Angie said. Porter sat down with his friends at the table. They were the saddest looking bunch he had ever seen, and he couldn't help but feel it was all his fault. I'm sorry, Porter said. I, I, I don't know what 
even happened. But I do know I let you all down. It's okay, Sage said. All inventors learn from trial and error. Today was the error part, but there will be better days. Sage rose to his feet. Let me go get some supplies to clean this up. Together they swept the stage and wiped down the sawdust covered tables. They used the giant wet dry vac to suck up the shavings off the carpet. Porter and Sage carried the failed machine back to its place in the storage room. Porter was desperate to look inside it and troubleshoot, but he knew that if he hoped to end his night still employed, he needed to focus on one thing, following Jack's orders to the letter, no matter how demanding or ridiculous they were. He and Porter returned to the stage and mopped up the dusty residue. By opening time, all evidence of the disaster was gone. Jack emerged from his office and surveyed the dining area. See? Porter said. Spotless. You can't even tell what happened. It'll do, Jack said. He took two steps closer to Porter, so he was standing right in his face. That dangerous piece of equipment you're responsible for could have destroyed my whole restaurant. He pointed his index finger at Porter. You're fired. The rest of you too. Get out. Now. So you make us clean up, like we're going to be opening, and then you fire us. Sage said, confused and hurt. Jack grinned through his rage. You see, unlike you all, I'm not a fool. I knew if I fired you, then asked you to clean up, the place would still be dirty. <laughs> to be fair, that's kind of genius. <laughs> um, another ex extract from the puppet carver. This, is, this feels weird to say because I am reading the puppet carver, but I'm reading the puppet carver inside the puppet carver. It's, it's weird. Sylvester knew that he could feel now because he had felt pain beyond imagining. After he had fixed, after he had paid the fixer in money and promises he didn't look forward to keeping, the fixer had connected Sylvester to the machinery and pain had shot through his body with the force of electricity as every new nerve, muscle, bone and tendon in his body was shocked to life. The pain was so strong he seemed to be able to see it, even hear it, as its intensity drowned out the sounds of his own screams. Jesus. <laughs> but since Sylvester had paid the price in pain, now he could feel pleasure too. As he walked the city streets, he could feel fresh air in his new lungs. He crossed the street, went into the park and touched the bark of a tree. Hard, rough. He stopped at an ice cream truck and bought a cone just so he could touch his lips to its coldness. A lady walked by with a fluffy white dog on a leash. Excuse me, could I pet your dog? Sylvester asked her. The lady smiled. Sure, Sophie loves everybody. Sylvester knelt down and buried his newly sensate hands in the dog's fluffy coat. Tears sprang to his eyes. Now he knew what soft meant. Thank you, Sylvester said to the dog's owner. The woman looked at him strangely. She said, you're welcome, but quickly walked away. Sylvester looked down at his hands. They felt alive. For the first time since his creation, he felt alive. His hands itched and burned in desperation. All he could think about was what he wanted to touch next. Oh, these are like separate stories with cliffhangers and I absolutely love it. I love how this is going so far. Oh my gosh, okay. Jack sat alone in his office looking at the evening's new re uh, few receipts. The only good thing about his situation was that he'd finally fired his idiot employees so he could at least wallow in his misery and peace. He knew if he went home, Becky would, ha would want to talk to him about whatever new ways she had found to spend the money that they didn't have. He knew he should have a talk with Becky about finances, but he couldn't bring himself to do it yet. Becky had married him in part because he was a good catch with a promising future. How could he tell her he hadn't made good on that promise? Would she even stay with him if the money ran out? This was a woman who grew up with a monster, with a, a monster, a mother telling her, it's just as easy to love a rich man as a poor man, and who had jokingly suggested that the words for poorer uh, be struck from their wedding vows. Tick, tick. What was that noise? Jack didn't know if it had been going on a while without him noticing or if it had just started. Either way, now that he had heard it, he couldn't stop hearing it. Tick. Tick. It sounded like an especially loud watch or a ticking time bomb. Had somebody planted a bomb in the restaurant? If they had, it was a blessing. Jack tried to turn his attention back to his bookkeeping, 
But the noise was too distracting. Tick. Tick. It was more than distracting. It was maddening. What was that Edgar Allan Poe story Jack had read in high school? Where the guy kills the old man and then is driven crazy by the non-stop beating sound of the old man's heart. It was like that. Tick. Tick. The sound seemed to be coming from behind the stage. Maybe it had something to do with one of the animatronics. Well, there was no way to get any work done with this sound rattling around in his brain. He might as well try to find the source and see if he could make it stop. Tick. Tick. The sound was louder when he was on the stage, so he was definitely getting warmer. He went backstage to the storage room. Tick. Tick. <laughs> The sound was much louder now, it seemed to be coming from the back of the room behind an old dusty curtain one of his idiot employees had hung up for some reason. He pulled back the curtain. Tick. Tick. The sound was much louder now, unbearably, unbearably loud. Jack clamped his hands over his ears. He looked at the disabled animatronics lined up like figures in a wax museum. They weren't where the noise was coming from. Tick. Tick. It was coming from the contraption, the horrible mechanical abomination that, f that fool Porter had made. The ticking sound, clearly coming from deep inside the machine's bowels, was making it shake so hard it seemed in danger of falling over. Jack pushed the button on the outside, but nothing happened. He opened the door and the sound grew so loud he was sure it could be heard from outside the building. Tick. 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 There was some type of control panel inside the machine. Maybe if he just stepped in for a moment, he could find the right button to make the horrible ticking stop. He stepped inside. It was a tight space. Jack hated tight spaces. The door slid shut with a click. He reached out to open it, but there was no handle on the inside. He thought of banging on the door and yelling, but there was no one there to hear him. And even if there were, there was no way he could be heard over the horrible ticking, which was now so loud it felt like it was coming from inside his own skull. But then the ticking was drowned out by the whirring of machinery the contraption appeared to have turned on. He looked at the walls of the machine. They were lined with circular blades that had started to spin and were now extending from the walls towards his body. What was it that idiot could call this machine? The puppet carver? Jack's heart pounded in terror. He was going to be carved. There was no way to escape. All around him, the sharp metal blades reached toward his body, less than an inch from making contact with his arms, his legs, his face. That was it. He was going to die, and painfully. How long would it take, he wondered, for someone to find his body? No one would think to look for him here, not until there was a smell. Jack shut his eyes and prepared for the worst. Bang. <laughs> he gasped. Startled by the deafening noise, the loud bang was followed by a cloud of black smoke that filled the small space where Jack was trapped. There was a smell of ozone. <laughs> yes, I made it into the story. Oh, do you think this is the writer's way of putting me into a story? <laughs> okay, okay, I'm, I'm joking. He coughed and wondered if he could... Oh my god, asphyxate... Asphyxiate, asphy asphyxiate, that's it, before the blades in the machine had time to shred him. Wait, the blades. The blades had stopped spinning. The machine was quiet. It must have malfunctioned in some way. The door slid open, releasing the smoke from the compartment. The machine made a sad sputtering noise, and then was still. Jack was alive. He couldn't believe it. He stepped out of the compartment like he was stepping into a new, better world. He looked himself over. No harm done. Not to him, anyway. The puppet carver might be broken beyond repair, but it hadn't really worked right in the first place. Jack felt himself smiling. When was the last time he had smiled genuinely? He couldn't even remember, but now, back from the cliff's edge of death, there seemed to be so many reasons to smile. The problems that had consumed him before didn't seem as important. Money didn't matter that much. All that mattered was that he was alive. Jack walked out the building. He looked out, up at the night sky. The stars sparkled and the moon blanketed um, the world in a silver glow. It was so beautiful that tears sprang to his eyes. When was the last time he had really seen the moon and stars? When was the last time he had cried? Looking back at the last decade of his life, the only feelings he could remember were anger and fear. 
anger at his employees, at his wife, at his son. Fear of losing money, power, status. What kind of a life was that? Well, that stopped now. It was a new day. Well, a new night anyway. He was going to be nicer to his wife, to his son, to his employees, to all the random people he transacted with in day-to-day -day life. Jack felt his heart brimming with love and kindness. He was like Ebenezer Scrooge in A Christmas Carol after his encounter with the ghosts. No longer a mean old... old miser. <laughs> but a man who could find the goodness in life and people and even within himself. Jack got in his car. How fortunate he was to have such a nice car. How fortunate he was to have a car at all. Many people were not so lucky. He started the car and headed toward home. He hoped Becky was still awake. He had a lot to say to her. Oh, he said as he drove by the Golden Heifer. He turned back to the restaurant and pulled into the drive through line. When it, it was his turn, the voice on the intercom said, Thank you for choosing Golden Haifa. Please order when you're ready. Actually, I have a question to ask you, Jack said. Yes, the voice said. Are you the young lady who is working the drive through Tuesday night? He asked. Um, yes, sir. She sounded uncomfortable. Good. I've got something I need to say to you. I'll just pull up to the window, okay? Uh, would you like to speak to the manager? No, my beef is with you. Jack laughed. Get it, beef, because cause you sell hamburgers? He couldn't tell if the drive through worker thought this was funny or not. When he pulled up to the window, the young woman said, Oh, you. Yes, me, Jack said. But I'm a very different me than I was last night. I wanted to apologise for my behaviour. You'll be learning a new job, and you were doing your best and being very polite, and I was rude. I'm sorry. Thank you, the young woman said. But her inflection rose as if she were asking a question. Ha! <laughs> Banged it. Clearly she was finding this encounter puzzling. Thank you, Jack said, for your politeness and understanding. He sat there and smiled at her. You're welcome. The young woman looked at the line of cars growing behind Jack's vehicle. Did you want to order anything, sir? She asked. No, I'm good. He found himself chuckling. I'm, I'm really, I'm really, really good. Uh, you have a nice night now. You too. Did he did he have drugs or something? <laughs> did he do drugs? Don't do drugs, kid. Uh, uh, do, kids. Eh. If it does turn out that he, he did drugs in the end, then people are just going to be like, that's not how it works. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know why. I don't know why I'm talking about this. Um, Jack drove away, feeling the weight of one of his regrets lifting. But fixing one isolated incident like a drive through dust up was easy. With Becky, with Tyson, there were years of bad behaviour on his part. Way more than he could fix with a simple, I'm sorry. An idea popped into Jack's head. Donuts. Donuts would be a start. Back when he and Becky had been young and broke, they used to meet for dates at the Donkey Dough Man, an all-night donut place near the coffee shop where Becky had been working at the time. Despite its stupid name, the Donkey Dough Man was the perfect place for a cheap date. The two of them would scrape up enough money for a donut each. Chocolate frosted for Becky and maple frosted for Jack, and two cups of coffee. The manager didn't mind that they only spent five dollars and took up a booth for hours talking and drinking cup after cup of coffee. Or, if he did, he never said anything. That was back when he and Becky really talked to each other. Before the money, before parenthood, before all the stresses of responsible adult life, they talked earnestly uh, about their dreams, their goals, their future. If Jack brought home donuts from the Donkey Dough Man, maybe it would remind her of those conversations. Maybe it would be the first step toward getting them talking again. There was no street parking near the donut shop, so Jack had to use the parking garage a block away. He wasn't thrilled by this fact, really. The, dun the Donkey Dough Man wasn't in the safest neighbourhood to be wandering at night, but he had become increasingly convinced that showing up with a bag of donuts might be the path back to Becky's heart. It was a thoughtful gesture, and it had been a long time since he had been thoughtful. Jack didn't like parking garages. There was something eerie about the flickering fluorescent lighting and the way sounds echoed. The elevators always seemed to be on the verge of breaking and were infested by foul and mysterious odours. Jack breathed a sigh of relief when the elevator doors opened. He hustled toward the garage's exit. 
At first he heard only the sound of his own shuffling footsteps, but then he was sure he heard another pair of footsteps behind him. He casually glanced over his shoulder. There was no need to be afraid. It was probably just some regular person on a regular errand like he was. But Jack saw no one. He chalked it up to the weird echo effect of the parking garage and walked through the exit onto the street. He, put, he walked past the dry cleaners and an insurance office. Most of the businesses on the street were dark and locked up for the night, but in the distance he could see the light of the Donkey Doman sign with its smiling donut mascot. He heard the footsteps behind him again. He turned around but only saw a flash of movement as whoever it was ducked into an alley. Jack was pretty sure he was just being paranoid after his near-death experience earlier in that day. It made sense that his nerves were on edge. He heard the steps again. They sounded wet, squishy, like somebody walking in galoshes uh, in the rain. Jack started walking more quiet, uh, quickly sorry, and the steps sped up to match his. He was tempted to turn around and confront the person, but what good would that do if the person were armed? He broke into a run, though he knew he was too out of shape to run for long. The squishy steps behind him ran too. Suddenly the donut shop seemed too far away to be a safe destination. He had to go inside somewhere to find a place with people and lights, a place where his pursuer would not follow him. He caught sight of an office building on the left, tried the door and found it open. Once inside, he noticed that the door had a chain, which he quickly fastened. There was also a lock on the doorknob, which he turned. Feeling a little safer, he took a deep breath and turned around to survey the place where he found himself. There were no people, and the only light was from a single bare bulb overhead. The building looked abandoned. Graffiti had been spray-painted all over the walls. The glass in the windows had been smashed, and doors that had once led to offices had been torn off their hinges. He glanced inside one room to see a desk and a broken office chair and piles of garbage, probably from people who had been squatting in the space. Squatters. There was something else to fear. But the building was as silent as a mausoleum, or mausoleum, and he seriously doubted that the potential mugger who had been following him would go to the trouble of trying to unlock the building's front door. For the time being, he was safe. He glanced back at the front door just to confirm that he'd locked it and saw there was movement in the tiny crack between the bottom of the door and the floor. Something was oozing through the crack. It was some sort of gelatinous substance and its movement was slow and steady. It was pink, but it was a horrible pink. Not the pink of cake frosting and party balloons. It was the pink of some living creature's insides. Okay, I think I know what this is. I think I know what this is, but just in case um, you guys don't know what this is, I'm just going to keep reading and hope that uh, it, it's, it gets explained. Um, Jack took a step backwards. He knew he needed to move more quickly, but he was transfixed by the sight of whatever was in front of him, although it had the appearance of some sort of goo. <laughs> There's your clue. <laughs> There's your clue. It's, it's, it's Fazgoo. It's Fazgoo. It has to be Fazgoo, right? Um, it seemed to be moving under its own power. It wasn't an inanimate substance. It was alive. Yeah, I, I think we assumed this. Okay, okay. Fazku boys, Fazku, it's back. Inky Ink is uh, on the floor dying right now. <laughs> the sudden realization shook Jack out of his trance and he ran down the hallway. He heard the squishy, sloppy steps behind him again, but he didn't turn around to look. He just kept running. At the end of the hall was a door marked exit. He pushed on the door, but it wouldn't budge. Was it locked from the outside? Broken? He turned around. The thing, whatever it was, was getting closer. It was just a pile of parts he couldn't make sense of. Much of it was somewhere between solid and liquid, but there were fully solid parts of it as well. Bundles of long, snake-like tubes, veiny bags and pouches. When Jack was a little boy, he had spent winter break at his grandparents farm. He remembered watching his grandpa and uncle butcher a hog once. They had hung its body from a tree. His uncle had sliced down the hog's middle and its guts had spilled out into a bucket with a sickening splat. This thing, that was how it sounded when it moved. Oh god, oh god, why do I know that sound? Since he had no luck with the exit, 
Jack tried another nearby door. It was unlocked. He quickly opened it, darted in, and slammed and locked the door behind him. He was inside another ruined office. The floor was strewn with garbage and the window was cracked. But strangely, a plaque still hung on the wall saying Employee of the Month. Wait. Oh, sorry. Yeah, a plaque still hung on the wall saying Employee of the Month. An empty bookshelf about the height of Jack's waist had been knocked onto the floor. Jack dragged it to the door and shoved it under the doorknob at an angle. Winded, uh, Jack sat down in the chair behind the desk. Here he was, looking like the boss he had been for years, but in a ruined office, hiding in fear for his life. He should have known the locked door was useless. Long, slimy tendrils were already snaking their way through the cracks underneath it. Pink slime dripped around the sides of the door and pulled onto the floor, merging itself with the creeping tendrils. Just like the tendrils that we see in... Uh, he told me everything. Uh, Jack looked to the window as a possible escape route, but more of the globby substance was slithering over the windowsill. Jack looked back at the door, where the thing continued to ooze out. Is there more than one thing, or is it all the same thing? What's... what? what is happening? <laughs> My question exactly, what is happening? Uh, there was a loud slurp... a uh, loud? Loud slurping sound, like someone trying to pull their feet out of deep mud. Rapidly, so fast that you couldn't even make sense of it, the mass of slime and solids reconstituted... Re... reconstituted... Um, <laughs> itself into an upright being that sat in the chair across the desk from Jack. The thing had approximations of arms and legs and a lumpy mound that stood in for a head. It was made of the translucent pink goo, under which its organs were visible. Oh, God. Somehow it reminded Jack of the awful gelatin salad his mum used to make, with canned fruit suspended under the slimy surface. It had no mouth or nose, but it had eyes dark eyes that stared at Jack as though the thing could see into him the way he could see into it. What? What do you want? Jack asked, his voice trembling. He didn't want to die, not when he had just had one near miss, not when he was just remembering what was important. The creature kept looking at him, then slowly it raised one arm and reached toward him. Like elastic, its arm stretched, growing thinner as it reached across the length of the desk to touch Jack's face. <laughs> Elastigals here. <laughs> pain like Jack had never known shot through him. But it wasn't physical pain. He felt the pain of hurt, neglect, abuse. It was the pain of every employee he had ever yelled at or fired. The pain of his son every time he had missed one of his ball games or unfairly criticised him. The pain of his wife for every forgotten birthday or unkind word. Oh, oh, oh. oh my god. Jack was filled with all the emotional pain he had ever caused, and it was more intense than he could bear. He doubled over and squeezed his tear-filled eyes shut, sure he was about to die from a real broken heart. But then the pain left him, just as suddenly as it had come, and he was awash in an overwhelming sense of relief. When he opened his eyes, the creature was gone. Becky was in bed but awake, watching one of her shows about home remodelling on TV. Hiya, Bex, Jack said, pleased to hear his old pet name for her come out of his mouth. He sat down on the bed next to her. Can I talk to you for a few minutes? Sure. She aimed the remote and switched off the TV. Is everything okay? You're not sick or anything, are you? Her brow furrowed like it did when she was worried. No, nothing like that. Good, I mean, it's, it's been a very long time since you seemed like you wanted to talk to me, so I was afraid it was going to be something bad. It is bad, but you've done nothing wrong. Uh, I wanted to say, I know I've been a bad... No, it's nothing like that. Good, I mean... Wait. Wait, <laughs> wait. <laughs> I was very confused there. Okay, it's it's a, it's a duplicate, sorry. Um, I, I was... So I was afraid it was going to be something bad. It is bad, but you've done nothing wrong. I wanted to say, I know I've been a bad husband lately, and I'm sorry. Lately didn't begin to cover it, he knew. He couldn't remember the last time he'd acted like a decent husband. Maybe when Tyson was little? Wow. There were tears in her eyes, which she wiped away. I wasn't expecting that. But from now on, you can expect better of me. 
You can demand better of me. He felt his eyes getting a little teary too. Part of the reason I've been on so on edge is money. The business isn't doing well, Bex. The animatronics keep breaking. Families aren't showing up. I'm losing all this money on food. I, I don't know how much longer the pizza playground can limp along. Becky took his hand and held it. It had been a long time since she had done that. Oh, honey, you should have told me. And here I've been yammering away about remodeling and all this stuff that costs a lot of money. I never would have even suggested it if I'd known you'd been worried about money. From now on, you've got to promise me that you will tell me when something's wrong. Jack nodded. I will. I promise. And I promise I'll do the same. She looked him in the eyes. Actually, you know, I think the reason I've obsessed over the house so much is that I've been sad ever since Tyson left home. Fixing up things in the house distracted me from how much I miss him. Oh, I miss him too, Jack said. Nobody tells you how hard it's going to be when your kid goes off to college. Becky wiped away another tear. They act like it's going to be one big party, but it's not. Actually, I've been thinking I might go back to work. There's an opening at my old real estate office and they called to ask if I was interested. I figured that way I could keep my mind active and see other people during the day. She squeezed his hand. Plus, if I got a job, we'd have two incomes instead of one. It might ease some of your financial worries. Jack tucked a lot of hair behind her ear. If that's really what you want to do, then I support you. But before Tyson was born, Becky had been a successful real estate agent. He had to admit that the thought of someone else in the family earning money was comforting. It's really what I want to do, she smiled. There's no need to be a stay-at-home mum when there's no kids staying at home anymore. It was either get a job or get a dog to turn into my surrogate child. I think you made the right choice, Jack said, smiling in return. Say, do you think Tyson's still up? It's not even 11, and he's a college student. Becky said. Of course he's still up. For him, the night is young. C'est la vie. <laughs> uh, she snuggled down under the covers. But it's past my bedtime. Mine too, Jack agreed. But all the same, I want to give Tyson a call. Jack took his phone into the kitchen and poured himself a glass of water. Tyson answered on the first ring, but he sounded low. Hey buddy, Jack said. I just wanted to check in to see how you're doing. I promise I haven't spent any of your money, if that's what you want to know. No, I wasn't calling about money, I was calling about you. Really? Tyson's tone had a hard edge. Because when you when we talked earlier this week, you wouldn't even let me tell you about the car emergency I had. You were too upset that I had charged your credit card $900 to make the repairs. Jack felt a little tug at his heart. Was what Tyson's saying true? Could Jack really have been so cold? I'm sorry if that's how I seemed. You didn't have an accident, did you? No, but I, I could have easily. My car broke a belt on the interstate and just stopped dead. It was a miracle I didn't get hit. All these cars were whizzing past me and I was right in the center lane. Finally, a police officer helped me get the car moved on to the side of the road and called a tow truck. Oh God, <laughs> that wasn't a very good accent. Called a tow truck. I was really scared, Dad. His voice broke with emotion. Anybody would have been scared in that situation, son. Jack felt the full weight of guilt bearing down on him. I'm I'm just glad you're okay. Did the mechanic get the car fixed okay? Yeah, it's running great now. Good. Jack knew that the mechanic had overcharged Tyson, taking advantage of the fact that Tyson was an in inexperienced boy who didn't know what a fair price was. But the important thing was that Tyson was safe. You couldn't put a price on that. Listen, buddy, I'm going to let you go, Jack said. I'm sure you've got way more interesting things to do than to talk to your old man. If you need anything, let me know, okay? I love you, buddy. I love you too, Dad, Tyson said, sounding confused. Oh my god, I didn't think this was going to be a, an emotional story. <laughs> I did not think this was going to be emotional at all. Um, okay. Doobie doobie doo. Jack climbed the stairs, put on his pyjamas and brushed his teeth. He slid into the cool, clean bedsheets uh, beside Becky, who was already asleep. As soon as Jack closed his eyes, so was he. It was a deep, peaceful rest. Porter didn't have much of an appetite, but he nibbled on, on his toast and sipped his coffee. He couldn't face the two sunny-side-up eggs on his plate and wasn't sure why he had ordered them. 
except out of habit. It felt like the eggs were staring at him judgmentally. He knew that was what was bothering him, was the same thing that was bothering everybody else in their booth in the Golden Heifer, uh, where they were having their traditional late sun... Oh my gosh, Saturday morning breakfast. They had all received a call from Jack, all agreed to report back to work at the pizza playground, but they were fearful about what might happen when they got there. Angie was toying with her pancakes. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how bad a mood do you think Jack will be in today? An 11. Definitely an 11, Sage said, picking at his fruit plate. I've got a job interview at that fancy new steakhouse on Monday, Edwin said. They're still hiring, I'm just saying. I don't think I'd ever get hired as a server someplace fancy, Angie said. I'm not ladylike enough, you know? She crammed a whole strip of bread. Of bre- ah! <laughs> she crammed a whole strip of bacon in her mouth, as if to illustrate her point. I'm doomed to sling pizzas at preschoolers. Yeah, I guess the fancy steakhouse has animatronics. They need somebody to service. Porter threw him. Sorry. Yeah, Sage said, laughing. But wouldn't it be weird if they did? There'd be all these rich adults eating steak and lobster and singing head, shoulders, knees and toes, along with Baron Von Baer and his friends. Edwin smiled at Sage and shook his head. You are weird, man. But they're hiring cleaning staff for the the night shift. You ought to apply. Fancy places need their bathrooms clean just like regular places. That's encouraging to hear, Sage said. You know me, student and novelist by day, toilet scrubber by night. Ooh, sexy. (laughs) Uh, They paid their bill and walked together to the pizza playground with all the enthusiasm of condemned prisoners. When they reached the building, they saw the outside had been decorated with dozens of brightly coloured balloons. A sign read, special today, large cheese pizza, four drinks, for ten dollars, includes 25 free game tokens. Porter couldn't imagine Jack ever voluntarily giving away anything for free. That's actually a pretty good deal, he said. Apparently other people thought so too. A family of four paused and looked at the sign. The dad reached into his wallet, pulled out a $10 bill and said, why not? The family went inside. Wow, Porter said. I feel almost hopeful. Sage wasn't as enthused. Be careful. Remember that Jack has given us plenty of reasons to be pessimistic. Porter had to admit that Sage was right. They entered the dining area. Jack was standing next to the table with the family who had just come in and was chatting with them as he filled their glasses and set the pitcher with the rest of the soda on the table. Porter was shocked to see Jack pleasantly interacting with and actually waiting on customers. Did you see that? Angie whispered to Porter and Sage. Since when does Jack hand out free refills without customers practically begging for them? Since now, apparently, Porter said. And look at his face. What is he doing? Sage was similarly in shock. I think he's smiling. (laughs) Seeing Jack smile was like seeing a dog dancing on his hind legs. It wasn't physically impossible, but it seemed highly unlikely. There's my stellar staff, Jack said, giving them a friendly wave. Edwin, would you be so willing to go into the kitchen and make those fine folks one of your delicious pizzas? Sure, Edwin said, looking at Jack like he had just sprouted an extra head. (laughs) Angie, Sage, Porter, how are you guys doing today? Jack said, grinning at them. It's getting close to final exams, isn't it? Are you studying hard? <laughs> For some reason, it just, he just feels like a completely different person. Like like a presenter or something. Um, you know you know what I mean? Do you know what, you, do you know what I mean? I've, I hope you know what I mean, otherwise I'm going to sound stupid. Uh, that's why I'm putting on a different voice for him. It's, it's quite funny. It's like a Markiplier voice. Like, are you studying hard? Um, Porter looked over at his equally confused friends. Y- y- yes, sir. That's good, Jack said. I'm proud of you. Thank you, sir. How much do you want to bet that Jack isn't actually Jack, but he is a Fazgu replacement of Jack? I reckon that's probably what is going down in this in this story because it will match like the phys I guess chemistry of um like the the science of what happened in he told me everything it's this the same sort of concept but maybe that's not how it's going to go maybe maybe I'm not predicting very well 
Angie, Sage, Porter, how are you guys doing today? Jack said, grinning at the- I just realised I'm reading the same line. <laughs> I hate that. Um, Jack grinned warmly at the trio, taking them aside. I do hope that all of you will accept my apologies for my behaviour yesterday. Ah, uh, that is a spelling mistake. Um, I also hope that you'll accept a two dollar an hour raise. He gave Porter a chuck on the shoulder. And what's with all this sir stuff? There's no need for formality. This is pizza playground. We're here to have fun. Porter and Sage shared a look. In the past, Jack had always demanded that his employees call him sir, as if he were their drill sergeant in boot camp. Another family of four came in, perhaps also lured by the $10 special. Welcome, welcome, Jack called, like an enthusiastic game show host. Oh my god, I basically said that. <laughs> Who's ready for pizza, games, and a show? All the kids cheered while their parents smiled down at them. Angie seated the new family and took their drink orders. Porter went behind the stage to make sure that the animatronics and sound system were in good working order. On the other side of the curtain, he could hear children talking and laughing, the games in the arcade beeping and blipping. He wasn't sure what had caused the change, but whatever it was, Pizza Playground had started to feel like it, what it was supposed to. A place for families to have fun. A place where the employees helped create an atmosphere of entertainment and even enjoyed themselves in the process. But how could the place have felt so bad yesterday and feel the opposite today? How could Jack have fired the whole staff yesterday, then rehired them and showered them with kind words in a raise today? It didn't make any sense. Porter remembered something his mum used to say. When good luck happens, don't question it. It was sound advice. He programmed the show to start. He stepped backstage so he wouldn't be seen by the audience. The canned music started to play and the sparkly red curtain parted to reveal the two patched together, barely moving animatronic figures, the bear and the weird bird thing that now made up the house band. Even with just two performers on the stage, the kids in the audience screamed like rabid fans at a music festival. Porter chuckled. It was nice that they were enjoying the fruits of his labour. Later tonight, he thought, I should tinker around some more with the puppet carver and see if I can figure out what went wrong. Maybe if I can get it fixed and if Jack's still in a good mood, he'd be willing to watch another demonstration. A successful one this time. Oh no! Oh no, he's gonna do... Oh no, something's gonna happen. I don't know what's gonna happen, but something's gonna happen because of that. Like, I, I was just thinking just now, like, oh, a happy ending to a story, but I don't think this is gonna be a happy ending. The $10 special had been a success. Families had trickled in over the course of the night to take advantage of the cheap dinner offer, and business, though not blooming, blooming, booming, had been steady. Jack felt encouraged. No, he, he felt more than encouraged. He felt great. Tonight, he looked around at uh, around the restaurant. He saw not a doomed money pit, but a place full of possibilities. He just had to think harder about ways to bring people in. And tonight had been evidence that when he put his brain to use and tried something new, his efforts would be rewarded. Making the place a success was a challenge, but it was a challenge he could rise to. One question he could write question one reason he could rise to the challenge was because of his great employees but in order to ensure their loyalty he had to let them know that he appreciated them porter and angie were wiping down the tables in the dining area and sage was mopping the floor they were all such hard workers he knew edwin was working equally hard cleaning up the kitchen once the money was rolling and better jack thought he should hire a dishwasher to help edwin out in the kitchen when business was booming and jack uh, felt sure that it would soon. One guy in the kitchen wouldn't be enough. Hey, are you guys doing anything special after you get out of here? Jack asked. Angie looked at Porter and Sage, who shrugged. Just studying, probably. Well, if you guys can stick around for a little bit after closing, I thought I might offer some Chinese takeout. My treat. No need to study on such an empty stomach, right? Angie smiled warily. Sure, Jack. Thanks. It was strange. When Jack was kind to them, they seemed suspicious, like they didn't trust him, like there had to be a catch. Well, he was just going to have to work harder to earn their trust. That's the truth, Porter said. No offence to your pizza cooking skills, Edwin. Edwin smiled, none taken. 
I probably get stick I probably get sicker of it than the rest of you since I'm cooking and eating it. You've been really nice all day today, Sage said. He looked at Jack with a strange intensity. It's like you're a new man. Jack smiled, happy to be at a table full of happy people sharing good food. It felt like a holiday, a celebration. It was the way things should be. He wasn't sure why things felt so different, so much better, but they did. Jack really was a new man. Extract from the puppet carver. Sylvester held his newborn daughter in his arms. Oh my God. With one hand, he touched her impossibly soft cheek. His eyes filled with tears at the same time his lips spread into a smile. This, he thought, this was what it meant to be human. The end. So I'm assuming that's a whole metaphor for Jack. I, I don't know. Sage couldn't believe it. The novel was finished. As he walked backstage to the storage room, he read and reread the novel's last line, smiling to himself. Sage would never admit it to anyone, but he was so moved by the beauty of this novel that there were tears in his eyes. It had taken him so many long nights of writing and rewriting, of sacrificing sleep and time with friends. Finally, he was completely satisfied with his work and hoped that soon a publisher would be too. And then it would be goodbye, pizza playground, and hello, bestseller list. He laughed out loud. He knew he was being ridiculously optimistic, but why not? It could happen. He just needed to do a favour for a friend, and then he could go home to celebrate. Sage pulled back the glittery purple curtain. There it was, the puppet carver, named in honour of his novel. Porter had told Sage he was going to have to go back to the drawing board and develop what would hopefully be a more effective puppet carver 2.0. The old machine would have to be scrapped, but Porter said if he hadn't, if he didn't have the heart to do it himself. Oh yeah, Porter, Porter said he didn't have the heart to do it himself. Sage had promised that he would take care of it. Sage wrestled with the machine, trying to figure out the best way to get it outside to the dumpster. As he tugged on it, he became aware of a slight sloshing sound. That's where the fazgoo came from. Okay, and then there was the smell, a rotting fetid smell that made him gag. It seemed to be coming from the bottom of the machine. <gasps> oh no. Is it is it the body of, of Jack? Is it Jack's body? Please be Jack's body. That would be amazing. Uh, a rotting fetid smell that made him gag. It seemed to be coming from the bottom of the machine. Maybe a rat had crawled in there and died or something. Sage kneeled in front of the puppet carver so he could reach the drawer at the bottom that served as a reservoir for all the waste generated during the carving process. Here we go, he muttered as he prepared for the source of the smell. When he pulled out the drawer, the smell was so strong that his nose was assaulted. The sight was even worse than the smell. Slimy pink entrails and mangled organs. Was that a kidney or a piece of a liver? Not the organs of a rat, but of a much larger creature, human-sized. Sage had no idea what could have happened here, but it was all the more reason to get the whole thing to the dumpster as fast as possible. Holding his breath, he dumped the contents of the drawer in a, in a garbage bag. They landed with a wet splat. He knew, yes, oh my gosh, he knew what? He threw the bag in the dumpster and walked away, ready to put his days at the pizza playground behind him. And I'm assuming that's the end. Ah! No! No, you can't leave us with that. You can't leave us with that. Are you kidding me? Oh, okay. I have a lot of questions, actually, about, about this story. I feel like it's relatively straightforward, but at the same time, it's all just speculation. The first question I have is, what does any of the Sylvester stuff have to do with any of the story? I get it was only Sage's story that he was writing. I, I, like, I get that that was part of the story, as in he was a novelist. But it, it's, it's a clear metaphor, right? It's a metaphor for what, though? I feel like it was a metaphor for Jack, mainly because he started as a puppet with no feelings... 
See what, I, see what I'm talking about? He started with a puppet's no feelings and then became a human being. Much like how Jack, at the beginning of the story, d just didn't have any feelings for anyone. You know, he, he didn't care about anything. Uh, but, at, but at the end, he really cared about everybody and saw that this was what it was like to be a human. To be able to look up at the stars, to be able to look up at the moon and be able to feel something from it, you know? So I, I feel like that's, a, that's the metaphor there. That's just speculation, though. I don't know if you guys have anything better to to correspond that with um, or, or to make parallels with. Um, and then the final question, of course, is uh, what's going on with the Fazgu and stuff in this story? I assume that the puppet carver... Huh, I don't know. Because there was no mention of, like slimy stuff or anything in the puppet carver near the beginning so i don't know i don't know my first impression is that the puppet carver has fazgu and that is what was chasing uh jack obviously after he had the encounter with the puppet carver um and then there was a replacement at, at that moment and then during that replacement the goo jack became the good jack and then the goo jack uh, threw away the real jack into the drawer of the puppet carver but i feel like that's a bit of a stretch i don't know guys if you have any opinions on any of this um any theory speculation then please do tell me i really enjoyed this story it was a very good way to start um but yeah tell me guys what you think i will see you in the next story, which is Jump for Tickets, which is the one I'm most excited about in this, this book. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you later. Goodbye.